It is trivially easy to find non-East Asian people who are obsessed with anime, manga, K-pop, or K-dramas. However, you would be very hard-pressed to find a non-Chinese person, and let's be fair, even most people of Chinese descent in Western countries who have the same degree of affinity for Chinese pop music or contemporary Chinese television shows. But why exactly is this? Why is it that you frequently hear about Koreaboos and Weeaboos, but you almost never hear about Chinaboos? Westerners who are obsessed with Japanese or Korean cultural products are a dime a dozen after all. Why has China never really been able to create music, film, or television that has deeply resonated with international audiences? Why was Kung Fu Panda, a highly successful film rooted in Chinese culture, made by Americans of all people? These are questions that have puzzled both Chinese and international analysts alike. After all, you would expect that China, a country with the world's biggest consumer entertainment market, second largest population, and second largest economy, would be highly primed to dictate global tastes. Sheer probability alone dictates that there must be plenty of talented creatives in the country. Yet, Chinese cultural products have been severely outshone by those from South Korea, a country with a population almost 30 times smaller with a fraction of the political and economic clout. This has been a question of great personal interest to me. After all, I'm a person of Chinese descent living in America, yet I speak and read Japanese far better than I do Chinese, and I have a YouTube channel dedicated to analyzing Japanese cultural products. I started thinking more about this when I downloaded Honkai Star Rail after it was released in April. Upon reflection, it dawned on me that the most successful cultural export that has come out of China in recent history has been Genshin Impact and to a lesser extent other mobile gacha games like Ark Knights, Azure Lane, or Girls Frontline. The massive international success of these types of mobile anime style gacha games begs an interesting question. How exactly did China's most successful pop culture export become anime gambling simulators for smartphones? To answer that, we have to first backtrack to the initial question of why Chinese popular culture has never caught on in the West to the same degree as Japanese or Korean cultural products. A popular answer, especially of Chinese analysts, is that the Western aversion to China's pop culture is a downstream result of the geopolitical rivalry between the US and the People's Republic of China. This, in turn, leads Westerners to overlook Chinese pop culture because they can't see past negative stereotypes of China. The most extreme version of this argument is that especially in recent years, the Western political and social climate has become actively Sinophobic. On the contrary, South Korea and Japan have been staunch Western allies since the end of the Second World War. Is it any wonder then why Chinese pop culture products are sidelined? For one, I think the premise of this argument is flawed. There are a large number of people in the West that are interested in Chinese culture, history, and language. It's just that none of that really seems to translate into contemporary Chinese cultural products like Chinese pop music, television shows, or movies. Anecdotally, my university required that all students take three semesters of coursework in a foreign language. Despite this, less than 30 students each year would typically choose to take Japanese. On the other hand, the Chinese department was substantially larger. Of course, a big percentage of this was Chinese internationals and American-born Chinese people trying to find an easy way out of the requirement, but there were a very large contingent of non-Chinese people taking these Chinese language classes, much more than the people enrolled in Japanese. Another issue of this argument is that it was never really a given that Japanese culture would catch on to the insane degree that it has in the West. This is only a quaint memory today, but many of the same portrayals of China as a hostile power that unfairly wields its economic power to the detriment of Western interests were regularly leveled against Japan during the late 20th century. This is a phenomenon that I detail in my previous award-winning video on MAGA's role in saving the Barnes & Noble bookseller, but during the 1970s and 1980s, Japan's economy started growing at such an exponential rate that it started becoming a matter of concern, especially in America. Japan's heavy industry in particular was basically driving the big three US auto manufacturers of Ford, Chevy, and GM into insolvency. 
a fact that did not sit well with many Americans. This anti-Japanese animus was best exemplified by the infamous murder of Vincent Chin, a Chinese-American who was wrongfully identified as Japanese and then beaten to death by disgruntled American autoworkers. By the 1980s, there was no shortage of Western pundits arguing that Japan's economic success had only come as a result of unfair trade practices, theft of intellectual property, and a government that did the bidding of the keidetsu, or business cartels, at the expense of ordinary citizens. If any of this sounds familiar, it's because these are almost the exact same criticisms that are levied against the Chinese Communist Party. But yet, this anti-Japanese sentiment did little to combat the meteoric penetration of Japanese cultural products in the West. Perhaps the even bigger issue of this anti-Chinese sentiment argument is the profound popularity of Japanese cultural products not just in the West, but also across East and Southeast Asia, especially in places like China and South Korea, two countries with levels of anti-Japanese sentiment that put Western Sinophobia to shame. The Chinese government has regularly sought to combat the popularity of Japanese culture among the country's youths, by censoring various anime and manga the government finds objectionable. But these efforts have had very little impact on curbing the massive popularity of Japanese and Korean cultural products among young people in China. China's lack of meaningful popular international cultural exports is also not the result of trying. The Chinese government invests millions of dollars to facilitate the development of movies, TV shows, and video games. Since the 2000s, China has sought to raise its international prestige and image to limited success. Yet, on the other side of the Yellow Sea, South Korea was essentially able to transform itself from its cultural and economic backwater to a global leader in pop culture. If you had asked a typical Westerner about Korea even 10 years ago, they'd probably say something like, Oh, isn't that the wacky place with the fat dictator? Or, I think my grandfather served in Korea. Yet, nowadays, if you tell someone about Korea, you're much more likely to get a comment about how much they really like BTS or Blackpink or something. This transformation was, in no small part, due to significant investment from the Korean government. And it's really not an exaggeration to say that without that government backing, the Korean wave as we know it would likely not exist. How was the Korean government able to spend its way into becoming a global cultural powerhouse, yet the Chinese, a country with a population and economy that is orders of magnitude greater, failed? The short answer is censorship. This is a point that seems obvious but is worth elaborating on. At the core of art, particularly narrative arts like books, movies, or television, is conflict. Many of the most famous books or movies become so because they provide profound or interesting commentary on complex social and political issues. Narrative media gives us a medium to explore these difficult aspects of the human experience. However, such complex socio-political narratives, especially ones that might critique to the existing social order, are simply not allowed in China. The Chinese government carefully examines and regulates the kinds of media that are allowed to be distributed in the country. The laundry list of topics that you're not allowed to depict or discuss is so numerous that it's probably easier to ask what is actually allowed. Obviously, any sensitive political content is banned. Any discussion or allusion to topics like the sovereignty of China's territories like Tibet, Xinjiang, or Hong Kong, even attempting to mention the Tiananmen Square Massacre is another well-known red line. However, it goes much further. The government also prevents the dissemination of content that they find morally objectionable. This includes a blanket ban on pornography, but also restrictions on the depiction of LGBTQ relationships, or even excessively effeminate men. When the government works to promote and create films, TV shows, or movies, they typically demand the depiction of quote-unquote good socialist values. Again, the Korea comparison here is illuminating. While it's easy to forget today, for the first 40 years of its existence, the Republic of Korea was effectively a dictatorship that was arguably only marginally less authoritarian than its neighbor to the north. The most consequential of Korea's leaders from this period was Park Chung-hee, who ruled the country from 1962 to its assassination in 1979. Under Park's rule, media and art was heavily censored. Films were carefully screened and scrutinized by the government. The government also banned many types of music. 
This was both to prevent the dissemination of any media critical to him or his government, but also to prevent the spread of foreign influences within the country. Quite understandably, it's probably not a coincidence that Korean pop culture only started to take off after these censorship policies were relaxed. So Chinese movies and TV suck because government censorship heavily limits depiction of interesting or nuanced stories. That doesn't seem that hard to understand. How then does this explain the budding cottage industry of anime gacha games that come out of Japan? Well, it's because these kinds of games are typically not deemed worthwhile by the government to aggressively censor. Moreover, the nature of the Chinese gaming market tends to heavily favor mobile games over bigger budget PC or console projects. After the Chinese economy was opened to international markets as a part of economic reforms conducted by Deng Xiaoping, modern electronics like televisions, arcade games, and home video game consoles started rapidly flowing into the country. Pirate NES consoles, marketed as educational devices, started rapidly finding their way into the hands of Chinese children and adolescents. By the mid-1990s, one survey reported that up to 60% of Chinese students owned a home game console. The competition among these off-label NES systems was so intense that a version bearing the endorsement of none other than Jackie Chan himself was created. However, as anyone with Chinese parents can tell you, video game playing is not exactly looked highly upon. Concerned that video games would make children indolent and unproductive, the Chinese government put forward a policy that effectively killed the domestic sale of home video game consoles in June of 2000. Because of this effective ban, China never developed the same console gaming culture that Japan or most Western countries did. Rather, the nexus of Chinese gaming shifted from consoles to online gaming, typically conducted in internet cafes. Games like StarCraft, Counter-Strike, and Quake started to rapidly take off in popularity in China. In the two years between 2002 and 2004, China's online multiplayer game market tripled in size. The explosive growth of China's PC game market was in part due to lax governmental regulation. Video games have generally not been considered especially important by Chinese bureaucrats and politicians. The focus has always been more on traditional visual arts like movies or TV. Online games like League of Legends or World of Warcraft really don't have the same kind of sensitive narrative elements that warrant strict scrutiny from government censors. When regulation of video games does occur, it's usually over minor things like changing a character's art to be less suggestive, or more recently over efforts to restrict the ability of youths to play video games in order to prevent video game addiction. In recent years, the widespread adoption of mobile phones in China has turned the country into the world's largest mobile gaming market. Chinese people, like many others in East Asia, typically have long commutes to work by train or subway, which is a perfect time to play mobile games. While buying a current generation home gaming console or a high-end computer capable of running high-fidelity AAA games is expensive, basically everyone has a mobile phone. Given these two trends, namely the outsized focus on mobile gaming relative to their western peers and relatively lax governmental regulations compared to other forms of media, it's no surprise that mobile games seem to be the area that Chinese companies have had the most success in. By the late 2010s, a number of Chinese developers had published mobile games that would go on to become major hits not just domestically, but internationally as well. Games like Girls Frontline, Azure Lane, Ark Knights, Alchemy Stars, Punishing Grey Raven, just to name a few, are all of Chinese origin. But of course, none of these games come even remotely close to Genshin Impact in terms of popularity. Some of this was due to fortuitous timing. The game came out during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when video game consumption and screen time in general was at its all-time high. But the game's lasting popularity is no fluke. In particular, despite being built by a company of the slogan, Tech Otaku Save the World, Genshin's lasting success is due in no small part due to its enduring popularity with women and people outside of what you would typically consider the kind of core anime gacha gaming audience. The generally accepted wisdom among gacha game developers seems to be that the game that can best attract the hardcore otaku audience are the games that will succeed. 
FGO continues to be one of the highest grossing gacha games, largely because of its tie-in with the hugely successful and expansive Fate franchise. Others like Azure Lane or Nikkei Goddess of Victory do this by trying to churn out the most lewd characters and art possible. Blue Archive is the pinnacle of this hardcore otaku targeting. The entire game is stylized like a bishoujo game. The voice actresses for the characters of the Rabbit Squad were all prolific edoge seiyus. They even got Io Sis of Toho fame to work on part of the OST. The developers are also 100% aware of all of those degenerate cunny memes, and they actively play into it. Genshin's brilliance was its recognition that they needed to appeal to more than just this narrow demographic of hardcore otaku. Genshin's female cast is generally a lot less sexualized than in most other gacha games. While most gacha games have few, if any, male characters, Genshin has a fairly sizable male cast that naturally grants more appeal to women. If you've ever been to an anime convention any time in the post-pandemic era, you've no doubt noticed that they are now filled to the brim with Genshin cosplayers, most of whom seem to be women. One of the aspects that has always stood out to me about Genshin and recently Honkai Star Rail is their storytelling and plot. I've played a lot of gacha games over the years and I am a chronic story skipper. Perhaps because MiHoYo literally does not allow you to skip the dialogue in their games, but Genshin and Honkai Star Rail are the only gacha games I've played where I've actually been marginally interested in the story, but maybe it's just Stockholm Syndrome from not being allowed to skip. When you look at the community for a game like Azure Lane, it's clear that literally no one is playing this game from the plot. It exists, and some people do try to read and make sense of it, but it's undeniable that the plot in a game like Azure Lane takes a backseat to the plot that most people are really there for. Genshin and Honkai Star Rail's stories are good because they're actually coherent and interesting. It's been a while since I've played Genshin, but Honkai Star Rail's plot is undoubtedly the best I've seen in any gacha game. Honkai Star Rail is the only gacha I've ever played where I'm actively interested in the new story that gets dropped every patch and want to and I'm looking forward to advancing the story in the future. To be clear, the storytelling in Genshin or HSR is it mind-blowing by any means? It's just leagues better than what's expected for mobile gacha games. I highly suspect the reason that MiHoYo is able to write a reasonably interesting and coherent story is because mobile games just aren't seen as worthwhile by the government to police. In fairness, the looming influence of CCP censors is far from completely absent. After all, I don't think it's a coincidence that MiHoYo decided to make Li Rei's Archon Zhongli the honorable god of contracts who believes in humanity's ability to live without the influence of divine beings, while Inazuma's Archon is the Archon of Eternity. And when you first set foot in the island, Inazuma is portrayed as being backwards, corrupt, and xenophobic. A seemingly not-so-subtle comparison between China and Japan. I don't think it's a coincidence that anime and mobile games, an area that the CCP is likely not particularly concerned about regulating, has become the very environment that has seen China's most internationally successful cultural products come out of. When Chinese censors do get involved, it seems to be more about policing how long the skirts on the character designs are, rather than substantively what's going on in the games. But of course, the elephant in the room for this entire discussion is that even though these are games created by Chinese developers, they still heavily rely on Japanese anime aesthetics. If you showed a layperson Genshin Impact, Arknights, Honkai Star Rail, Girls Frontline, or any other Chinese-made gacha game, and asked them where they thought that game was from, they'll almost certainly tell you that they think it's Japanese. The implication here seems to be that Chinese-made games are successful because they copy stylistic and visual elements from a totally foreign media tradition. However, I don't think that Chinese gacha games are only successful because they imitate Japanese anime. While they clearly copy the aesthetic trappings of anime, many of these Chinese-made gachas, MiHoYo games in particular, still have many distinctly Chinese elements in them. 
At just the most obvious level, these second areas of both Genshin and HSR are just different versions of China. The Rea is just an ancient version of China, and the Shanzo is just an ancient version of China reimagined for a sci-fi setting. Some of these games' most popular characters like Zhang Li, Hu Tao, Jing Yuan, or Jing Liu are heavily inspired by Chinese culture aesthetics and sensibilities. Aside from the surface level aesthetics, these games aren't really trying to pretend to be Japanese and actually heavily borrow from and integrate Chinese cultural and visual elements into the games. Again, this serves to underscore the point that the problem isn't that Westerners or non-Chinese people aren't interested or open to Chinese cultural products. It's just that modern Chinese TV shows or movies kind of suck. The success of China's growing gacha game industry is living proof of the inverse relationship between government censorship and artistic quality. The more you think about it, the less surprising it really becomes that China's most successful media export in the past 100 years has been Genshin Impact. Bang, bang, cha-bang!